are the multi-stakeholder group from the Green New Deal for Vermont. This is an effort that's being initiated actually by Wendy and I in, co in coordination with MIT Presencing Institute's Societal Transformation Lab. So we've been meeting. We had a meeting a month ago and this is our second meeting. So we'd like to welcome you to our second meeting. We'll be meeting at least two more times in April and May. Likely not in the State House, but we're hoping to have venues at two of the colleges that are involved, UVM and Middlebury, where we'll be meeting there. Partially because the State House rooms in April and May are difficult to book if you're not legislators, and we're not. So today we changed our agenda to allow for students who are involved in the student climate strike to make proposals for things that they think we can do to address the issues that the Green New Deal addresses, which include climate change, runaway inequality, racism, and poverty. So we're going to be open for that. I do know that the students who are coming from Middlebury College are going to be a little bit late. So we're going to wait for them to get here before we introduce that resolution. But we're open to other things that people want to discuss or consider. With that, I've asked Carol Irons, who is an elder of ours. She's an Abenaki elder. And I want to acknowledge that what we're doing is taking place on ancestral Abenaki territory. And we're trying to hold that in our hearts as we move forward with this effort. So I've asked her to offer some words of welcome this morning. First, we give thanks. The spirit moves through all things, only unique and seen in the ones who and we give thanks to all the life forms on the web of life, um, including the two leggings. And yes, I appreciate the recognition that this is Abenaki country. And all of those who usually are not given voice in these proceedings, I really ask with all my heart that you keep them first and foremost in your thoughts and your plans and your proposals, your ideas. They can live very well without us. We cannot live without them. That kind of humility, recognizing that we are just one thread in the web of life, um, I, I request that that guide our thinking because this is a societal transformation project and you can't transform the shape and direction of society if you don't recognize that humble part that we are. I give thanks for the people organizing this. I give thanks for all of you who came out and drove, set aside your day to participate in this effort. Ask that we step back from our own agendas enough to be able to hear each other in a good way, listening with our our inner ear and trying to see others' perspectives with our strong eye, which is here, getting beyond our own perspective and widening it to a very different transformational shape. So we welcome all of you. We give you thanks for your presence. Let us proceed. Thank you, Carol, and welcome again. Please move forward. We have seats at the table, there's seats up front, especially if you're here from a student organization. <laughs> we want you in the front, you guys, come on. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be proceeding using the town meeting format, which typically uses something akin to Robert's Rules of Order. But before we do that, since we're still a small group, I would like to go around and have everybody introduce themselves. Say your name, where you're from, if it's a town in Vermont, if, it, if you're here representing an organization officially, that would be good to know as well. So, why don't we start with Wendy? I'm Wendy Weber from Melbourne, and uh, I 
can represent the societal transformation that um, the presence of these two. Hi, I'm Lee Toronto. I'm a student at Overbury College and a representative of Sunrise and Overbury. Um, we're from a group that is of college students and high school students, but a very broad stranger kind of today, um, and we're really honored to be here. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm also from Middlebury College at Sunrise and Overbury, and thank you for having us here. I'm Bob Kennedy. I'm from Westmore. My name is Olivia. I'm also from Middlebury. I'm really <coughs> excited to be here. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Parker. I'm um, the public engagement coordinator for Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. We're working on uh, multi-occupancy electric vehicles uh, in uh, pilot projects in Montpelier and uh, continue open space along the Winter Sea. Swanberg, a resident of Montpelier, the Center for Climate Action. Carl Kovacek from Montpelier, Vermont, and from the Vermont Energy Education Program. Uh, Donald DeVoyle, Montpelier resident, uh, adjunct instructor in the Vermont State College System. Claude Murphy from Barrytown. Thank you. In the back? Jesse Scott of Montpelier, Vermont Climate Action. I'm Jerome. Uh, I'm covering <coughs> today's events for Orco Media. Hello, Erica Campbell with Office of Senator Sanders. Um, I work mostly on agriculture issues. Um, Haley Perro, uh, who covers energy and environmental issues for the Senator, wasn't able to come, so we're glad to, glad to be here today to listen to you all. Thanks. Tom Berry with Senator Leahy's office. I cover ag, environment, and energy issues for the Senator. Uh, from his Burlington office. I'm John Tracy, Senator Lady State Director, and we appreciate the invitation. We're here to listen and learn. Thank you. I'm Mark Christensen from Cabot School, Cabot High School. Uh, I'm Ethan Sonomar from Bristol. Carol Irons is still. I'm Alec Fleischer. I'm an environmental policy major at Middlebury College, and along with those folks, I represent the Sunday Night Environmental Group, the Vest Middlebury, uh, Sunrise Middlebury, a bunch of connected organizations. Great. Thanks, everybody. And, oops. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Gwendolyn Hossman, and I'm here with Vermonters for a New Economy. So, with that, let's begin our meeting. I had a gavel and I plowed it into order. Um, I think the first order of business would be to approve the minutes of the last meeting, which someone who was at the last meeting would need to move to do. Motion to approve the minutes. Great, thank you. Alec made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right, the minutes are approved of the meeting in January. Now, with that, are there any proposals for us? What, one of the things we asked our members to think about in advance of today's meeting was things that the Vermont legislature could do to advance the Green New Deal for Vermont. And I think we'll have a motion from one of you guys. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's both. Um, well, one thing we've been researching and would like to discuss is a resolution to endorse the federal Green New Deal on the state level. This would be a resolution, um, ideally joint House and Senate, um, and uh, what else? Oh, it, it would be modeled after past legislation or resolutions such as the one that was against the federal, the 
the resolution against Trump shutting down the federal government that was a couple months ago, maybe a month ago, I don't even know. Um, and then we have a second part, if you want to discuss that. So let me just clarify for the people that are here, because all of you are going to vote on this. We're in a town meeting and we're in it together and we're going to vote. The, res the, the, the motion, if I'm not mistaken, was for the Vermont State Legislature to endorse the Federal Green New Deal resolution that was introduced by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Markey. Is that the same one you're talking about? Yes. Great. And it would be modeled after, it would be following in the history of other resolutions that have passed the legislature to support something happening at the federal level. Is that right? Does everybody understand that so far? And there's a second part to that motion. Um, yes, so we were thinking that this is one way that the state legislature could, thanks, sorry. Um, so we're thinking that this is one way that the state legislature could take action in Vermont to support the action that Sunrise and uh, many, many other environmental justice focus groups are taking across the country. Um, so something we could do here to say Vermonters are on board, our state representatives are on board, um, and that if everyone wished we could also include in this resolution something about working towards a state level Green New Deal, um, or that could be separate, it's really uh, whatever everyone would be envisioning, but um, sort of joint supporting federal action and also working on a state level. Okay. okay, thank you. So the motion, as I understand it, is to endorse the federal resolution for a Green New Deal. Now, if you didn't take one of the copies of this resolution as you came in the door, there are over here on the table. I just suggest that you get it because once we have a second, I've asked people to help us read through it so that we all hear it and enter it into our record what we are asking this state legislators to endorse. So the first part of the resolution is to endorse the federal resolution on the state level, and the second part of the motion is to encourage the state oh, thank you. to do a Green New Deal for the state of Vermont. Is there a second for that motion? I second the motion. Yeah. Emily seconds the motion. So the motion was made and seconded. Now we'll open the floor for discussion. But before we discuss it, what we're going to do is read it. I've asked Ethan Sonneborn, who's also a high school student, to start reading through the first part. And Blue can read once he stops, which is just on the first part of page three. And we'll just go to the end of each page and keep going around the room until we're done. It's not that long. So you want to start, Ethan? Sure. <coughs> resolution recognizing the duty of the federal government to create a Green New Deal. Whereas the October 2018 report titled Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees Celsius by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the November 2018 Fourth National Climate Assessment Report found that, one, human activity is the dominant cause of observed climate change over the past century. Two, a changing climate is causing sea levels to rise and an increase in wildfires, severe storms, droughts, and other extreme weather events that threaten human life, healthy communities, and critical infrastructure. Three, global warming at or above two degrees Celsius beyond pre-industrialized levels will cause A, mass migration from the region most affected by climate change, B, more than $500 billion in, annual, in lost annual economic output in the United States by the year 2100. C, wildfires that by 2050 will annually burn at least twice as much forest area in the western United States than was typically burned by wildfires in the years preceding 2019. D, a loss of more than 99% of all coral reefs on Earth. E, more than 350 million pe more people to be exposed globally to deadly heat stress by 2050, and F, a risk of damage to $1 trillion of public infrastructure and coastal real estate in the United States, and global temperatures must be, global temperatures must be kept below 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrialized levels to avoid the most severe impacts of a changing climate which will require a global, a global reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from human sources of 40 to 60 percent 
from 2010 levels by 2030, and B, net zero global emissions by 2050. Okay, Blue, just continue to the bottom of that page. Okay. Whereas because the United States has historically been responsible for a disproportionate amount of greenhouse gas emissions, having emitted 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions through 2014, and has had and has a high tech and has high technological sorry, capacity. The United States must be leading must be the leading role in reducing emissions through economic transformation. Whereas the United States is currently experiencing several related crises, crises with one expectancy declining with basis sorry such as clean air, clean water, healthy food, and uh, adequate health care, housing, transportation, and education are inaccessible to a significant portion of the United States population. Two, a four-decade trend of wage stag stagnation, uh, deindustrialization, and anti-labor policies that has led to a hourly wages and overall stagnating since the 1970s, despite increased worker productivity. The third worst level B, the third worst level of social, socio, I cannot remember. Socioeconomic? Socioeconomic mobility in the developed world because before the Great Recession, C, Erosion and earning and bargaining powers of workers in the United States, and D, inadequate resources for public sector for the public sector workers to inform, confront um, challenges of climate change at local, state, and federal levels. Three, the greatest income inequality since the 1920s with A, the top 1% of earners accruing 91% of gains in the first few years of economic recovery after the Great Recession. B, a large racial wealth divide amounting to a difference of more than 20 times more wealth between the average white family and the average black family. And C, a gender earning gap the results in women earning approximately 80% less as much as men at the median. Thank you. Good job. How about over back there to John Tracy? Can you pick up where Blue left off? I was following. Where'd you leave off? Um, at the end of C, page uh, four. <laughs> this way we can ensure that the staff. I'm just going to read off bigger print here. <laughs> I'll be fine. Whereas climate change, pollution, and environmental destruction have exacerbated systemic racial, regional, social, environmental, and economic injustices, referred to in this preamble as systemic injustices, by disproportionately affecting indigenous peoples, communities of color, migrant communities, deindustrialized communities, depopulated rural communities, the poor, low income workers, women, the elderly, the unhoused, people with disabilities, and youth referred to in this preamble as frontline and vulnerable communities, whereas climate change constitutes a direct threat to the national security of the United States by impacting the economic, environmental, and social stability of countries and communities around the world, by acting as a threat multiplier, whereas the federal government led mobilization through World War II the New Deal earned the greatest middle class that the United States has ever seen, but many members of the front line of vulnerable communities were excluded from many of the economic and societal benefits of these mobilizations. And whereas the House of Representatives recognizes that a new national, social, industrial, and economic mobilization on a scale not seen since World War II and the New Deal era is an historic opportunity, one, to create millions of good high wage, high wage jobs in the United States, Two, to provide unprecedented levels of prosperity and economic security for all people in the United States. And three, to counteract systemic injustices. injustices. All four, be it, let me go into the result. Resolve. Maybe Tom can pick up. Resolve. 
That is the sense of the House of Representatives that it is the duty of the federal government to create a Green New Deal, to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions through a fair and just transition for all communities and workers. B, to create millions of good high wage jobs and to ensure prosperity and economic security for all people of the United States. C, to invest in the infrastructure and industry of the industry of the United States to sustainably meet the challenges of the 21st century. D, to secure for all people of the United States for generations to come, clean water and air, climate and community resilience, healthy food, access to nature, and a sustainable environment. And to promote, E, to promote justice and equity by stopping current, preventing future, and repairing historic oppressions of indigenous people, communities of color, migrant communities, deindustrialized communities, depopulated rural communities, the poor, low-income workers, women, the elderly, the unhoused people, people, the unhoused, people with disabilities, and youth, referred to in this resolution as frontline vulnerable communities. Okay, you want to move on, Emily? Erica? Oh, Erica, sorry. Yeah, no the worries. goals described? Sure. <clears throat> the goals described in subparagraphs A through E of paragraph one referred to in the resolution as the Green New Deal goals should be accomplished through a 10-year national mobilization referred to in this resolution as the Green New Deal mobilization that will require the following goals and project. A, building resiliency against climate change related disasters such as extreme weather, including by leveraging funding and providing investments for community defined projects and strategies. B, repairing and upgrading the infrastructure in the United States, including by eliminating pollution and greenhouse gas emissions as much as technolo technologically feasible by guaranteeing universal access to clean water by reducing the risks posed by climate impacts and by ensuring that any infrastructure bill considered by the Congress addresses climate change. And just a side note, we're considering an infrastructure bill at the moment. <laughs> uh, meeting 100% of the power demand in the United States through clean, renewable, and renewable and zero emission energy sources, including by dramatically expanding and upgrading renewable power sources and by deploying new, new capacity. Should I keep going? Um, why don't we continue with Bob Murphy? Okay. Building and upgrading? Building or upgrading to energy efficient, distributed, and smart power grids and ensuring affordable access to electricity. E, upgrading all existing buildings in the United States and building new buildings to um, achieve maximum energy efficiency, water efficiency, safety, affordability, comfort, and durability, including through electrification. F, spurring massive growth in clean manufacturing in the United States and removing pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from manufacturing and industry as much as technologically feasible, including by expanding acceptable uh, re renewable energy manufacturing and investing in existing manufacturing industry. G, working collaboratively with farmers and ranchers in the United States to remove pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural sector as much as is technologically feasible, including one, by supporting family farming, two, by investing in sustainable farming and land use practices that increase soil health, and uh, three, by building a more sustainable food system that ensures universal access to healthy food. Okay, H, want to continue? Sure. Um, <clears throat> overhauling transportation systems in the United States to remove pollution and greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector as much as technologically feasible, uh, as much as is technologically feasible, including through investment in one, zero emission vehicle infrastructure and manufacturing, two, clean, affordable, and accessible public transit and three, high-speed rail. I, mitigating and managing the long-term adverse health, economic, and other aspects of pollution and climate change, including by providing funding for community-defined projects and strategies. J, removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and reducing pollution by restoring natural ecosystems through proven low-tech solutions that increase soil carbon storage, such as land preservation and afforestation. K, restoring and protecting threatened, endangered, and fragile ecosystems 
through locally appropriate and science-based projects that enhance biodiversity and support climate resilience. L, cleaning up existing hazardous waste and abandoned sites, ensuring economic development and sustainability on those sites. M, identifying other emission and pollution sources and creating solutions to remove them. And N, promoting an international exchange of technology, expertise, products, funding and services with the aim of making the United States the international leader on climate, so, uh, uh, on climate action and to help other countries achieve a Green New Deal. Okay, Washington, with three, a Green New Deal. Must, three, a Green New Deal must be developed through transparent and of consultation, collaboration, and partnership with frontline and vulnerable communities, labor unions, worker cooperatives, civil society groups, academia, and businesses. And four, to achieve the Green New Deal goals and mobilization, a Green New Deal will require the following goals and projects. All right. Okay. Okay. Providing and leveraging in a way that ensures that the public receives appropriate ownership stakes and returns on investment, adequate capital, including through community grants, public banks, other public financing, technical expertise, supporting policies, and other forms of assistance to communities, organizations, federal, state, and local government agencies, and businesses working on Green New Deal mobilization. B. Ensuring that the federal government takes into account the complete environmental and so social costs of the of impacts of emissions through one existing laws, two new policies and programs, and three ensuring the frontline rural communities shall not be adversely affected. Okay, Catherine, you want to start with C? C. Providing <coughs> resources, training, and high quality education, including higher education to all people in the United States, with a focus on frontline and vulnerable. You want to go, Matt? Sorry, D. D. Making public investments in the research and development of new clean and renewable energy technologies and industries. E. Directing investments to spur economic development, deepen and diversify industry and business in local and regional economies, and build wealth and community ownership while prioritizing high quality job creation and economic, social, and environmental. Ensuring the use of democratic and participatory processes that are inclusive of and led by frontline and vulnerable communities and workers to plan, implement, and administer the Green New Deal mobilization at the local level. G, ensuring that the Green New Deal mobilization creates high quality union jobs that pay prevailing wages, hires local workers, offers training and advancement opportunities, and guarantees wage and benefit parity for workers affected by the transition. H, guaranteeing a job with a family sustaining wage, adequate family and medical leave, paid vacations and retirement security to all people of the United States. I, strengthening and protecting the right of all workers to organize, unionize, and collectively bargain free of cohesion, intimidation, and harassment. Okay. Jay, over here. I'd like to read J. No? Mahometer also. <laughs> How about Elizabeth? Sure. Strengthening and enforcing. Yeah, nobody comes right now. Uh, strengthening and enforcing labor, workplace, health, and safety, anti discrimination and wage and hour standards across all employers, industries, and sectors. K. Enacting and enforcing trade rules procurement standards and border adjustments with strong labor and environmental protections. Five, to stop or one, so on. And to stop and transfer of jobs, to stop the transfer of jobs and pollution overseas, and to grow domestic manufacturing in the United States. L, ensuring that public lands, waters, and oceans are protected and that eminent domain is not 
M, obtaining the free, prior, and informed consent of Indigenous peoples for, for all decisions that affect Indigenous peoples and their traditional territories, honoring all treaties and agreements with Indigenous peoples, and protecting and enforcing the, so, the sovereignty and the land rights of Indigenous peoples. And ensuring a commercial environment for every business person is free from unfair competition and domination by domestic or international monopolies. And oh, providing all people in the United States with high quality and high quality health care. Two, affordable, safe, and adequate housing. Three, economic security. Four, clean water, clean air, healthy, and affordable food access to me. Thank you to all the readers. I know it seems a little tedious to read through it page by page, but for my part, I know that when they pass phone book-sized pieces of legislation in Washington, like the Patriot Act, without a lot of the representatives having even read it, doing this at least ensures all of us that we know what this resolution is talking about. So with that, let's open discussion. Does anybody have a discussion on the motion? Brian? Yes, yeah, so hi, I'm Representative Brian Gina from Burlington. Um, I want to start by saying uh, thanks for coming today. Um, I'm going to be in and out of the meeting because this is the crossover day, so it's the day that we have to get bills out of our committees or they, got, or they go on hold for a while. Um, but I just, what, what I wanted to throw out there is while you discuss this resolution, just let you, a little bit, let you know a little bit about what the process is here with resolutions because um, that might inform how you choose to handle your resolution. So um, in, in the Vermont legislature, resolutions are two pages. And, and I don't know how long that was, but it was long enough that I heard it, went upstairs, voted on stuff, and came back, and you were just finishing <laughs> well, it. Well, the motion, Brad, is just to endorse this. Right. So we read this so we know what we read. Right, but I'm just letting people know that, there's, that our resolutions are two pages. So if you want to pass a resolution to ask us to pass a resolution, you might just keep in mind that we have two pages to make the point, and I would ask you to give us what you want in that resolution. You know, um, it would be helpful. Um, I want to empower you to do that, um, and I'm happy to work with other people to bring forward any resolution that you request. Um, the other thing I'd like to just say is that resolutions are kind of hollow. You know, like we can we can make a statement about how we want to do something. Right now, there's many climate change related bills sitting in committees and there's been a failure to take action on those bills. So um, perhaps something you would consider in your resolution is asking that we actually take action on things that exist that are being overlooked right now. Um, so just another thought I wanted to throw out there. I'm gonna stick around and listen for a minute and then I have to go back to committee. But um, I wanna thank you all for coming today. It's actually really significant that you're coming on crossover day um, and it really helps illustrate the failure of this body to act you know, this year on any significant climate change legislation. Um, and it's gonna help some of us to point to, to you and say, look, like the people are here demanding we do this. What are we doing? Thank, thank you, you, Brian. Can you give us a couple of examples of bills that the folks here might go home and make phone calls about tonight that haven't been moving out of committee? I'm not gonna be able to tell you off the top of my head the numbers of all these bills. What, I might, what might be better is for me to send an email out to the group and like later with a list. Sure. But some examples would be, there's people asking for um, radical investment in weatherization and electric vehicles in, in clean energy in Vermont, um, looking at creating green, you know, green jobs in Vermont. Um, there's a lot of legislation around those things um, in terms of like the, the short and midterm solutions, like things we can do right now to help. Um, and then in terms of a long-term vision, there I think H-126 is a bill to study creating a zero-waste economy in Vermont. So that's kind of bigger than just let's chip away at the problem. That's the, what do we want in 30 years and how do we get from here to there? Um, but I'll compile a list and send it out to the group if, if that's helpful. That'd be great. Yeah. Thanks so much. I know that the weatherization bills and the electrical vehicle bills are having some trouble, believe it or not. So let's put some pressure on the representatives. Um, I know S60 is a Senate resolution which is brought about by 350.org, which will do several things, but it endorses the, um, the current Vermont 
energy plan, which would be a 90% reduction by 2050, which the state is currently missing its benchmarks for. It endorses a ban on new fossil fuel infrastructure, as well as looking into things like weatherization. Um, we worked on this in Middlebury um, at Town Hall that passed overwhelming support. I believe it's now 40 something, 48, 49 towns that have passed this legislation, uh, non binding on the town level. So we'd love to see the state do that. Great. Okay, we're discussing the motion. This is town meeting format, just to catch everybody up. The, the, we asked the state representatives to endorse the federal Green New Deal legislation, resolution. Yeah, Bob. I just had a, a question, clarification. On page nine, uh, line 23, there's a word that I don't think I've ever seen before, and I was wondering what the meaning of it is. Afforestation? Afforestation, I assume it meant reforestation. Okay, well that sounds, that sounds reasonable, but <laughs> this is a word I haven't seen. It's talking about increasing soil carbon storage. So yeah. land preservation and reforestation may be the word they should have used. I, I've never seen that word. Reforestation is correct. Oh, it, it is, okay. I stand corrected. Other discussion on the motion on the floor, which is, again, to ask the state legislature to endorse the federal resolution, which we read into the record just now. Yeah, Carol? I, I cannot um, go along with this. This is based on the same, it's tweaking, it's got some good ideas, and it's got some ideals. However, it's based not on transformational change, but on continuing the economic system that's based on ever more money, ever more jobs, ever more of the same kinds of things that the society has had for several hundred years and that has brought us to this point. It's, so it's loaded with contradictions to me in terms of whether it's any real transformation or whether it's just finding other ways to allow us to continue being as greedy and, and exploitive as we have been for generations. So I cannot agree with it. Thank you, Carol. Are there particular language changes that would eliminate the concerns that you have? I think it's kind of loaded with contradiction. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Other discussion? Yeah, Brian. I, don't, I, don't, I just want to respond to, to Carol's concern because one of the, I mean, I, I don't want to stifle other people's interest in this, but I actually do have some concerns about the re, like greenwashing the New Deal. The New Deal was, was actually a disaster for indigenous people. Um, dams were built, um, land was flooded, um, ecosystems were completely disturbed by that. And um, one, of, one of my concerns about some of the short-term solutions that we're talking about, like things like electric vehicles and solar cells, is that when we had a, a decarbonization study here and I asked the consultant, did you look at the cost of the solutions? Like, did you look at the potential pollution? And they said, no. And I said, so you basically are just saying to us that if we do these 27 things or whatever it was, we'll meet our climate goal, but you didn't look at the potential harm of those things. And they said, no, we don't do that. And, and I, so once again, it's not that I'm saying we shouldn't start doing some of those things, but we need to think about, like I agree with you, we need to think about the big picture and then the, the zero waste economy concept is that it's like looking at the costs of the, of the benefits, you know, looking at, um, and so back to this resolution, I, I would still support it with the group, but I wanna just validate, Carol, like what you said, because um, this thing is filled with language that reinforces um, the system we have and it's grounded in the New Deal, which uh, for, for a lot of people wasn't actually a good deal. Thank you, Brian. Other discussion? Do people feel like they have enough information? Oh, Mash, go ahead. I, I just feel like I, I totally understand what Carol and Brian have said, um, but, but I also feel like this is the first major attempt to get climate change on the national agenda. It's, it's now the conversation. So um, I'd like to support this on a national level. In Vermont, I'd rather see us be more specific about our 
our agricultural society and things that we can do that I, I see people all the time go, I don't know what to do. You know, but we're, we're an agrarian state and there are things that we can do and I'd like to get those on the top of the table in, in our legislature, yet support this on a national level just to get people's focus on something's gotta be done quick. Thank you. So you're you're saying we should think of something that's specific to Vermont in addition to supporting the National Green New Deal. I'd just like to also take off my moderator hat for a moment and address Carol's point because I completely support your opinion on this. But I would like to point out just a couple things that are deviations from the normal way of business in Washington and in Vermont for that matter that are part of the reason Vermonters for a New Economy is interested in the Green New Deal. Because it is the first piece of legislation that I'm aware of, or the first big initiative that combines the imperatives of addressing climate change with the imperatives of dress, addressing economic inequality and the kind of oppression that we have had in this country against what they're calling frontline and vulnerable communities, which if you look at who those people are, they're all of us at some point in our lives. It's not a group of people off to the side. It's all of us and the impacts that it's had on all of us. So if you look on page 11, point A, where it says providing and leveraging in a way that ensures that the public receives appropriate ownership stakes and returns on investment adequate capital through community grants and public banks and other public financing, technical expertise supporting policies and other forms of assistance to communities and organizations. This clause is still in the resolution mode. It's, it's very aspirational, but it's talking about fundamentally changing some of the ownership structures that we've come to accept in the last 40 years and looking really hard at public financing, public banks, public ownership of the money systems and resources that we need to do this work. And so I'm not completely sold on this as an approach, but I am encouraged by the fact that the people that are thinking about it are at least thinking about how to do the monetary system somewhat differently with public banks and public ownership and public financing. So. In Vermont, we, as many of you in the room know, we've been pushing for a public bank in Vermont for the last eight years here, and that has not been successful yet. So if the Green New Deal was to pass at the federal level, one of the things that Vermont would need to do is to set up the Vermont Public Bank to make sure that we have the ability to finance the kinds of things that we need to do, and that our financing those things doesn't continue to fill the pockets of the elite among us at everybody else's expense. Because when we're financing public infrastructure, when we're financing things that the public wants, that should be from our public money, not from private money. So that's part of the reason I'm in support of this, and I would um, encourage other people to think hard about it. Knowing perfectly well it's not perfect, but we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, yes, Elizabeth. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have been sitting here. I, I, Carol, nice to have you here. I'm grateful that you're here. Um, and you know, I, I, looking at how Barry, uh, page six, uh, line eight, uh, E, to promote justice and equity by stopping current fermenting future or repairing historic oppression of indigenous peoples, communities of color, migrant communities, deindustrialized communities, depopulated rural communities, the poor, low-income workers, women, the elderly, and so on. And, and I, I guess that my hope is that in what the resolution we draft for, um, for Vermont, uh, for, the, for the legislature here, in the two-pager that we, we bumped that up a little higher so that that, that and the community funding that you're discussing, um, Gwen, uh, are really the, the foundation on which decisions are being made 
uh, going forward as we uh, uh, together find creative and important and humane and you know climate friendly solutions. So I just wanted to say that. Welcome. My name is Diane Hansi. We're just discussing the motion that was made by the Middlebury students to get the Vermont legislature to endorse the national resolution of the Green New Deal. Is there other discussion on the motion? Yes, Rebecca. Okay, so what you're suggesting is that the second part of this motion, I think, which was that we should have a Green New Deal for Vermont as well, um, that we spend a little more time on that part and figure out what that would say, and maybe not be so worried about endorsing the federal resolution. Is, do I understand correctly? Um, yes. Okay, great. Other discussion? I would ask the um, makers of the motion, if you want to add something to this one? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, um, thanks so much for everyone who's uh, providing comments on this motion. Um, I think from our point of view, the, the goal with this was just to um, have the Vermont legislature in some way express um, support for radical and rapid uh, climate action and, and climate action in the most just way possible. So like, I personally also share the concerns that this is not transformational enough. Um, and also that there are so many things happening in the Vermont legislature that have been proposed but that have not really gone anywhere. So um, to your point, I'm wondering if we would maybe would think about if we're asking for a resolution that we could write it in a way that really stresses the type of transformational change we'd like to see both in Vermont and nationally. Um, so sort of some sort of resolution the Vermont legislature stating that this is a priority, that these are the parts we want to stress, really stressing the transformational change piece while also saying we support um, rapid uh, just and transformational action on a, on a national level. I've got one more thing to say. Um, so yesterday, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, yesterday, Catherine and uh, Brian and I were at the Climate Caucus luncheon yeah, you know, all discussing, uh, you know, this first um, crossover uh, that's happening today, um, policy crossover. And, you know, it, it, it was so challenging because it's important that we do this big picture thinking. But I also want us to remember that we have to figure out, I, I, I just figure it's attorney and pragmatic how to fund it and how to make it work. And right now, the legislature is faced with such a crunch of financing. And how are we really going to be able to come up with, you know, clear ways of appropriating money, uh, you know, generating what is necessary to implement this vision? So I, I'm, I think that it's great that we spend time. It's important that we spend time crafting this carefully. But this is just a very first step in, um, you know, a longer process. So I just wanted to say that, and I, you know, I, I, I feel for the climate caucus here in um, the legislature because their hands have been tied by business as usual. And so, how do we make that paradigm shift into this new vision that we're talking about, and how do we ground that? Thank you, Henry. <clears throat> I just wanted to add, um, you know, I think that as compelling as any of our politely submitted proposals to the lawmakers might be, um, you know, some of the last words standing in masculine politics in this country are Martin Luther King saying in the late 60s, we have to create a crisis so powerful it cannot be ignored. 
meaning we have to create a mass movement on the ground that sort of crushes the polite dialogue and creates a power vacuum. So the only way out is to do something rational with us. You know, a couple months ago, or maybe a month ago, we were all talking about trying to support the student strike today. And, you know, I saw a lot of, oh, you know, we'd really like to, but, you know, our capacity is kind of low. That's not the kind of comment made in a burning building, right? The student climate strike is the only thing happening today. And we need to sort of reorient to getting that horse back in front of the cart and making sure that the mass movement generation is happening so that it creates context and a dialogue that's visible to the regular working Vermonter. Nobody, nobody knows about this, this wonderful exchange of ideas that's happening in here today unless they're already deeply plugged into the conversation. So that's sort of my approach. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, yep. I've been a climate activist for 19 years. I've done a deep, deep dive on the science, and I just always come back to Bill McKibben when he said, every time you have an argument with physics, you will lose. <laughs> and in addition, physics is a really unsentimental negotiating partner. And yet again, physics is really clear when the negotiations are over. And I look at two sets of laws. One relates to a game that human beings invented, including inventing the, the laws and the rules. The other are physics laws. And we're at a point where physics is telling us the negotiations are almost over. And yet, we prioritize the rules of a game that we invented, including all of the minutia, and saying that, oh, that's crazy talk. We have to be sensible here. We have to be fiscally responsible. Physics just doesn't care. And I'm not an economist, but human beings are nothing if not innovative and imaginative and creative. And I think physics is giving us the memo that we have best come up with a new set of rules for how we do economics and fund this or it's over. Thank you. And I, I'd like to just add that some of the most problematic rules of the game are the most relevant. And how money is created, how money funds the public infrastructure that we need and the answer that we need for climate change, and how it's going to be continue to be a stumbling block in the legislature as long as they consider business as usual. The, the legislature spends upwards of $150 million a year on debt service to the private sector from borrowing the money that we need to build our infrastructure. If that money was coming back, into the general fund, because we had our own bank to issue those bonds, it would have a lot more money to address climate change, poverty, and racism in the state than we do right now. That's my editorial. Did you have another comment? Yeah, I, I think this is, uh, I'd love to hear more from Carol about uh, her thoughts and concerns. Yeah. My, my understanding of what you might be pointing to is, is the the model of our global society as being proprietarian and consumptive by nature and, and having enormous impact on the planet as a whole. The effort of the Green New Deal is to make it more equitable, more rational, more efficient, and nonetheless it still has this character which is ultimately a destructive character. Um, I still think we need to be doing something, you know, and as much as I think we all need to be living more simply and humbly and kindly. Um, and I'm trying to do my piece of that and know where I can't can get to. Um, we need to help other people in that same trajectory of, of turning their behaviors. So there's a, there's a reason why we do any number of partial things on our way to a larger ultimate goal. I wonder in the resolution that we put forward if we could say something about how do we sustain you know, the, the values that Vermonters care about, you know, use it up, wear it out, make it do, do without, living simply, encouraging this as a principle. You know, physics, you can't argue with physics, we need this. Um, and these other things are just trying to help comfy people feel comfy during the change. And uh, I'm about to go drive to a wedding in Pennsylvania, and I'm going to be driving through Connecticut, you know, where the, where the the, the, the highways are posted at 55, people will be passing at 75, and uh, they just have very different expectation about what they're extracting 
uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania and New York and Connecticut and Massachusetts and most of Vermont, that we have to find ways of creating bridging pools. Uh, but we need to have language and vision about living in a way that is rational, loving, sustainable, at the heart of it. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> I think uh, that you know the motion to endorse this is a good idea. We should endorse this um, because we'll have something in place, and we do have climate on our side. It's going to create crisis, and but if something's in place, we can move on. I mean, that's, I don't see anything by a grassroots movement will move, move fast enough until people see. But it's coming. I mean, it will happen. So the crisis that Martin Luther King talked about is out there in Mother Nature, it's happening every day. Yeah, we do know that. Is there other discussion for or against the motion that's on the floor? And for those of you who may have come in a little late, we're discussing a resolution that would ask the Vermont State Legislature to endorse the federal resolution that was introduced by Alexandria or Ocasio Cortez and Senator Markey for a Green New Deal. Yeah. Henry? Yeah, um, just in terms of the pressing need here in Vermont, um, thank you so much for convening this. This is such a great format. Thanks so much. Um, <laughs> I would Howdy. say the thing that, you know, kind of speaks to my earlier comment, to make it more of a common issue, dairy farms are collapsing, they're getting suicide brochures with their paychecks every month. Um, regenerative agriculture um, and really changing the way that, especially big dairy farms are run in this state, not only addresses the water quality issues that are important to a lot of people, but also may be central to any economic proposal for this state that uh, helps to add some fuel to this fire and create a mandate for our legislature. And I think that that, that sort of synthetic element about regenerative agriculture being the possibly sole hope for both um, for the collapsing dairy industry and meaningful scale appropriate uh, climate solutions for the state should be more prominent on this document. I don't know if there's if there's an amendment process, but I would propose that as a as a friendly amendment, either before or after a submission to the legislature. Okay, well, there, there were two parts to the motion. One was to adopt and endorse the federal legislation, and the second was that we need a Vermont Green New Deal. And so what I hear you saying is that in the Vermont Green New Deal, you would see more of an emphasis on regenerative agriculture as a solution for the dairy industry in particular. I mean, imagine if the amount of carbon you see was monetized, and the dairy farmers could get a carbon sequestration check in addition to their milk checks. That's the kind of economic transformation I think you're talking about. Ecological services. Ecological services, exactly. So that's the kind of economic transformation we're looking at in order to make the incentive system that we have built into and baked into our economic system, which basically says the more money you make, the more money you make, the better it is. If you can change that incentive system so that the less carbon you use, the more money you make. The more organic food you grow, the more money you make. Instead of it all being based in money, that would be helpful. Just uh, with respect, I'm just trying to uh, propose the idea that that messaging is inserted because it has a base that's not common in this discussion, um, whether it's a federal Green New Deal or a state Green New Deal. It helps to illustrate the mandate at the same, to the legislature at the same time as advertising our interest in common cause with, a, with the only real economy in the state, which is the agricultural economy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other discussion? Can, can I just add to what Imagine them in, in the background? I just want to add to what you were saying. I think so far it's not been clear. We would need the legislature to uh, support, sponsor dairy farmers to transfer to managed grazing, plus the regenerative aspect. It would take a, a major shift in the way they do business, as well as organic farmers, vegetable farmers, being able to do uh, crop rotations and cover crops and stop tilling and all the things they need to do to practice regenerative agriculture. It takes 
a shift in econ economies for both kinds of farmers, and we need the legislature to support them. Great, thank you. In the back, I'm a organic farmer and an activist, and I really appreciate what you brought forward, and I like the idea of supporting this legislation, but honing in on some more Vermont specific information and I totally support uh, having an impact on all forms of agriculture. I, I think the dairy industry is going through a crisis. I totally agree with that. But I think that we need to be talking about regenerative agriculture. We need to be talking about it, but not just within the agricultural system, but within our municipalities, the way we handle our golf courses, the way we deal with our park systems, the way individuals put stuff on their lawn. We need to raise awareness to all of that and to help individuals know how they can make a difference in their own backyard. And I've been part of a soil series of educational discussions that have been happening in central Vermont, which has been really invigorating and exciting. People are coming. They're coming with their own skill sets and interests. So we're, these discussions are just scratching the surface and we're building networks. But So they want to learn from us farmers that are doing things that are interesting, but they also have expertise and stuff to bring to the table. So the energy is right in Vermont. This is a great place and I appreciate all the work that you do. And so yes, let's let's let let's make a statement and, and support this on a national level, but then let's show everybody what we can do on a state level. Great. Thank you. I, I can say that that is exactly what this group was set up to do. So thank you for that. Um, how about from our federal representatives? Would you like to make a comment about the resolution or about what, what either Senator Sanders or Senator Leahy is doing on the federal level? First of all, we want to be very respectful of the process you have here. You're talking about a resolution to the Vermont legislature and we're the federal delegation, so we appreciate the opportunity to be here and to hear what you have to say and engage. But we don't want to be in a position to tell the Vermont legislature what to do, just out of respect for the separation. Um, you know, Senator Lee's been very supportive of the Green New Deal. He's not a co-sponsor of legislation. Senator Lee's been a firm believer in actually writing the legislation that'll get accomplishments. Uh, in just reviewing, and I won't go into depth because I don't want to take up time in your meeting, but the things he's put in place, for example, the organic farming legislation. Pat Leahy wrote that into the 1990 Farm Bill because he knew we needed safe, sustainable agriculture, a way to keep farmers, prevent, provide healthy food. He did that. On an international level, he's been working in our state foreign operations budget to help protect the rainforest, to help economies throughout the globe that are suffering from climate change. So practical application, which we've talked about, the Green New Deal is, you would said, aspirational. It creates a vision. He's incredibly supportive with that. He will be supporting a resolution in the U.S. Senate because Senator McConnell filed cloture yesterday on the Green New Deal, which means they'll vote on it when they get back from this break that they have coming up next week, a work period. His goal is hopefully to have it fail, to put some people in a difficult position. The Democrats have a resolution they want to put forth saying climate change is real. Human activity in the past century is the driving factor in climate change and it's up to the United States and Congress to start doing something about it. So a more concise version of the Green New Deal to put that into play. With the Republican majority in the Senate, we don't know how that'll go, but that's the shifting of the playground right now. But incredibly supportive and continues to work on legislation with practical application, which he has been doing for some 40 some odd years. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to say something? Yeah. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Senator Sanders is a co-sponsor of the Green New Deal. Um, it, the Green New Deal is, is really an outline, as, as you've read today. Uh, it certainly doesn't have a whole lot of details in it, and it's certainly not perfect. Um, but it does start to sort of uh, align people around this vision of, you know, transforming um, our energy systems and a host of other things to start to address um, climate change. and. Uh, I, you know, I, I mentioned before, I, I work on agriculture issues, so that's kind of the angle I've been looking at it a lot. Um, there's a lot of conversations at the national level, uh, whether, you know, you know, just the, it was good that even the mention of agriculture was in it. I think earlier conversations about the Green New Deal didn't have it, and I know right now there are many 
uh, agriculture groups across the country trying to figure out um, what what is the role of agriculture in the in you know with a changing climate, um, healthy soils, a whole host of, of issues. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of things you could do in Vermont, and again, we can't, you know, we don't really want to comment on that, but um, being an outline, this Green New Deal will, you know, if it moves forward, and hopefully the elements of it will, it will be a whole host of different bills. It will be agriculture bills, climate bills, and we're working on climate legislation right now. Um, it will be social justice bills. I mean, it will hopefully be a whole compendium of policies that will get into, um, you know, more nitty gritty details, right? So, uh, again, Senator Sanders is just, you know, supportive of this bill and, and hopes that um, we can, you know, our country can come to, um, address climate change like we're not addressing now. So. Great, thank you very much. I just, I just wanted to say, say too, if I could, uh, even though both offices are weighed in, um, you know, we were whispering back and forth when the conversation turned to agriculture because it's what we do, and uh, um, if you uh, engage with the folks who are implementing agricultural practices in Vermont right now, you might, you might be amazed at how progressive some of the work that's taking place is and uh, you know, without belaboring the point, the, the conversation around um, uh, ecosystem services and carbon storage, uh, there was an agricultural meeting yesterday with a number of you know USDA people, Vermont Ag and Markets, uh, soil conservation districts, the folks that are out working on the farm, supporting traditional dairy among other farms, and a presentation by the Gund Institute from University of Vermont by some of the world experts on ecosystem services. And man, that room lit up. We went late, and they want the maps. They want to know how to start paying farmers for ecosystem services. And they're not talking about it doing it in two or three years or in the next farm bill. They want the maps so they can start putting those contracts out this year and start focusing some of the federal dollars. And so there's the opportunity to really lead on some of this uh, and a really strong interest uh, on, some, on players doing work on the ground in Vermont right now that um, Ag and Markets, UVM Extension, that you know, these conversations are taking place uh, well beyond this building, and um, there's some good stuff going, going on. Thank you. Uh, hang on. Let's. I have a question. Uh, Representative, I went to the Real Organic Project Symposium about a week ago in Dartmouth, and uh, they, the aquaponic, hydroponic issues, are you aware of that at all? They're, they're now, you know, considered organic because legislation that changed the original organic legislation that, you know, that they had set up. And that doesn't sequester any carbon at all when you have aquaponics and hydroponics. And soil health has nothing to do with it. I mean, the basic factories that run water growth and they grow the plants. Is that an issue in Washington right now at all? Respecting the process, I think, to the, the um, solitary meeting, I have to answer the question, uh, but just respecting the town meeting yeah. process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I was going to raise a point of order, but that isn't germane to the motion exactly, but we can discuss it this afternoon when okay. we're doing open okay. space. I do okay. want to let everybody know that the town meeting is scheduled from 10 to 12, and then we're going to take a lunch break. And then from one to three, we're going to be doing what we call open space format meeting, where we could, for example, draft the two-page resolution that Brian will need to introduce to the legislature, if that is of interest. We can discuss topics that are particularly interesting to all of you, because all of you help us set the agenda for that section of the meeting. Um, so hydroponics and aquaponics and organics could be a topic of that discussion, then, for sure. All right, back to the motion, which was, thank you to, by the way, to our fellow representatives. Back to the motion, which was two, two parts. One, and oh, I think maybe the clerk should like to read what she has written down as our motion. We're trying to do this like a town meeting. Um, the resolution, um, So for the 
about uh, the meeting to uh, endorse the federal resolution that was read, read out. Um, sorry, is that? That's, that's one yeah, of the first part. And the second part, um, to, uh, to write a two-page resolution um, that would be the month's uh, version of the agreement. Okay. So the motion on the floor is to direct the state legislature to endorse the federal resolution, that's House Resolution 109, and I think it has another number in the Senate, for a Green New Deal, and to encourage the Vermont State Legislature to develop a Green New Deal for the state of Vermont. Is there any further discussion on this motion? Yes, Elizabeth. So I, um, I greatly appreciate the, um, the huge importance of carbon sequestering that um, our agricultural community uh, can offer and will shoulder. Uh, the, the largest uh, carbon emitter, to my understanding, uh, in Vermont is transportation. And um, you know, one of the things that we really have to focus on, and I hope we put in a two-pager, um, is to really figure out how to transition to an integrated uh, fixed route uh, between uh, populations, uh, between cities, and a dynamic route within towns. Um, I've taken a map of Vermont and uh, you know started to look at what we have for fixed route uh, and how we can use instead of going horizontally from gas to electric uh, single occupancy vehicles, kind of jumping over and taking a, you know a, an evolutionary leap and uh, having the um, having us start to invest in multi occupancy electric vehicles that can service uh, pockets, uh, denser pockets around the state. Uh, obviously, uh, we have a lot of rural areas, but we also have a lot of populated areas that this would be very suited toward. And um, the statistics are uh, from uh, UC Davis that using multi-occupancy electric vehicles can reduce the uh, transportation carbon output by 80%. So I think we need to look at that too. Okay, that would be on the Vermont side of the resolution. Yep. Great. Other discussion? And I do want to invite anybody new in the room on this question. If you have something to say, you're more than welcome. Okay, come sit up here. All right. Yes, I have a question, if that's all right. Um, so I was just wondering um, if for those who said uh, worries that this was not transformational and enough, if in the resolution that we would be proposing to the legislature, if we were to state in that we think that this is a start, but there needs to be going beyond that and really needing to stress that issues of equity and justice is the heart of that, if that were to be as part of the resolution to the state legislature, would that address some of those concerns for people? Um, that's just something I'm, I'm wondering. Okay. Um, I'll turn the floor over to Carol. I think that that's I think I appreciate you hearing me, and that that begins it. Yes, <laughs> it's a can of worms, and it's it's going to be a long process. But if they feel like everybody's buying into this, there's a lot in here that will be used, in spite of the idealistic kinds of paragraphs, will be used to walk right over that to to keep keep the systems going. So. You know, that saying that it's only a start at least keeps your toe in the door. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. Okay, great. Seeing no further discussion, it's time to take a vote on this issue. Now, everybody in the room is eligible to vote because this is the meeting that we had about this. You came to a posted meeting. We're running it as a town meeting. You know, if you have a regular town meeting, everybody who's a registered voter that shows up is able to vote on the issue. So I'll just say it one more time, yeah? But presumably not non-registered voters. Oh, if you're here in the room, you can vote on this motion. <laughs> this is, the 
in the stratosphere of non-binding, you see, because we're just a community over a multi-stakeholder group working with the MIT Presidency Institute. And we're going to take what you vote on and we're going to present it to our federal and our state representatives, to be sure. But um, in terms of what you represent and whether your vote will be counted against you in some strange way, don't worry. Um, so, to repeat the motion again, the motion was to endorse, to get the Vermont State Legislature to endorse a federal resolution for a Green New Deal with the caveat that it is only a starting point and is not transformational enough, and to encourage the Vermont Legislature to develop a Green New Deal for Vermont. Does that adequately reflect the motion as seconded by the Middlebury students? We just add um, some language that we really want to center the issues of justice and equity as the main point here. Okay, to center the issues of justice and equity that are part of this Green New Deal. I think that's one thing, at least I can comment on, that I didn't hear in the more mainstream Green New Deal resolution you were describing. Um, Mr. Tracy, who's here from Senator Leahy's office, talked about another Green New Deal resolution that's going to A, recognize that climate change is real, about time, and B, recognize that it's time to do something about it. But if that resolution could include the same emphasis on justice and social equity and economic transformation as this legislation does, that I think would be more amenable to the group here from what I've been hearing today. So, with that, all those in favor of the motion on the floor, please raise your hands. Oh, can't we say aye? Uh, you so can say aye too, but I wanted to visualize. I think to see it together would be okay. wonderful. And say aye. Aye. All right, all those opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. And we will be passing this along. Now, are there other, is there any business <laughs> is there any business before the meeting, I, for one, heard a lot of talk about what the Vermont Green New Deal <coughs> should look like. Um, yes, so, Emily. Um, before we get into that, we were wondering if it would be possible for, as a group, to motion, or I don't really know how the town meeting structure works, but to motion to have, um, to ask the, the Senator Leahy to co-sponsor the federal Green New Deal. The only thing I'd offer on that is I think when he described where Senator Leahy was now, the fact that it's passed Closure, closure. It means that it's, it's he can no longer co-sponsor it. Correct. Okay. okay. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. He's evoked McConnell has evoked closure, which means the debate will start next week as to whether the week after they get back next week's a work period. They're on recess. The Senate will be in Vermont. As to whether it's amendable or it can have additional co-sponsors, I don't know the answer to that question. Oh, so it might be possible. Well, so I, will, I will tell you though. I mean, I'm not. Let's. It, Okay, for me to. Yes. I don't want to monopolize the meeting. Senator Lane is going to continue to work on legislation, bills that will make a difference, like he's done the appropriations bill. And because he, just because he's not a co sponsor of a resolution does not mean that he is not supportive of those goals because he is and has been for a long time and will continue to work on legislation that actually has an impact. I went through the FY 2019 appropriations bill yesterday with the highlights that were passed. It deals with social and economic justice, about environmental justice, about public transportation that benefits individuals, that has communities involved in the process. There's chapter and verse. Here's an advocate of the Second Chance Act, for violence, violence against women, legal service corporations that provides over 1.8 million people with legal services. So the nuts and bolts of what is being strived for in the Green New Deal, Pat Lee has been working on and will continue to work on. Legislation. Thank you. Um, Henry, and then in the back. As a happy medium uh, to your request, I think that a request to Leahy's office that he publicly endorse um, the Green New Deal as the, uh, as the legislation uh, that has the context and wildfire uh, at the grassroots, I think that that would be a, that would be a strong second. So I think 
Okay, so let's see if we can put it in the form of a motion in a second. It sounded to me like Emily was going to ask that a motion be made to ask Senator Lazy to endorse the Green New Deal resolution that's before the Senate. Okay, so Emily moved, if I'm not mistaken, that this group, which is again a multi stakeholder group drawn from around Vermont, people interested in looking at what a Green New Deal might look up like for the state, ask Senator Leahy to endorse the Green New Deal resolution. And I understand Henry seconded that motion. If I can interpret their interventions in the spirit of what a town meeting would look like. So we have a motion in a second. Is there discussion on this? Or, or well, that would be a, an amendment. Alec has added or co-sponsor, if possible, yes, we go. the, the <laughs> resolution. Um, is that that's a friendly amendment? Is that acceptable yes. to the motion and second? Okay. Is there further discussion on this? Yes, Luke. Um, we just wanted to add that we brought a whole bunch of letters about this from the people who are on strike back in Middlebury, um, saying that they would really like to see this action from the senators. So, um, yes. Yeah, so, we brought those. Yeah. Olivia, yeah. would you like to present those to the senator staff? Thank you.
first of all, we have to reduce our emission, but we have to do it in a way that is uh, not only protects, but elevates low-income and rural Vermonters. And the uh, resources for the future report that came out a couple weeks ago mentioned that uh, we'll probably need a combination of carbon pricing and non-pricing policies. And I just wanted to highlight the rebate programs that uh, were in the Essex plan, where um, the, the general rebate balances returning the revenue to all Vermonters, while the low-income and rural assistants make sure that the Vermonters that would be impacted the most are supported um, and helped with, like, with energy transition. And I would just ask that uh, when we're thinking about the Green New Deal for Vermont, we're thinking about how to how to be equitable and use any revenue from any carbon pricing programs that we might have uh, in an equitable manner, protecting the low and rural Vermonters, and how we can uh, hope that the federal Green New Deal will model itself after that as well. Great, thank you. So she was talking a lot about how the energy transition is particularly difficult for the frontline and vulnerable communities mentioned in the legislation, and how we need to make sure that the revenue models we develop and the policies we develop put those interests first and foremost so that we help them make the transition and help fund the, the needed services. Is that summarized? That's that summarized. OK, thank you. Again, so if you're interested in helping us draft the two-pager for the Vermont legislature, please let me know, and we will do that as a topic in the open space session that goes from one to three. Is there other business to come before the committee and before this group? Yes, Lee? I was wondering if we could discuss um, the, how we all feel about the Vermont Equity and Infrastructure Act as introduced by Representative Gonzalez. I was talking to Hope, um, who's one of the leaders of the um, Montpelier Youth Strike today, and she was saying that uh, she and others have been conceiving of that as sort of a Green Mountain New Deal. Um, and so she, I think she was, well, I can't speak for her, obviously, but she was sort of wondering where that group, where this group stood on that um, and how it related to our um, maybe broader and hopefully even more transformational vision of a Vermont Green New Deal. Great, so the question is, do we have a stand on Vermont's Equity and Infrastructure Act? And if so, what can we do to help move it along? I know for my part, I'm, I don't know the language of the act. I would like for us to do something similar as we did today, where we took the language of the actual legislation and looked at it, but that can certainly be a topic this afternoon. Um, I'm sure by then we can get the language of the act up, and then at our next meeting, we could vote to endorse that. There's, there's a yeah. one page uh, that uh, is available online from Diana Gonzalez of the News Group. Uh, it's got highlights and whatnot. Um, so Great. I would just put that on our agenda for the next meeting. How about Maybe that? she could read that to us. Sure. It's, it's, it's very, I'll let this be later we want to talk about it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. because it's, it's not, um, it's, they've got highlights on um, weatherization and so incentives. Okay. Yes, Henry. Um, I just have a quick announcement and request. Um, students are meeting at U32 at 12.30 today. Um, the request is for most of these marches that it's only for youth, so if you identify as youth, maybe 25 or under, uh, you're welcome to come to U32 at 12.30 or of course the MHS at two, but if folks wanted to post right now on their Facebook pages or other social media, get to U32 at 12.30, that's that's kind of a, a more, op, uh, it's an awesome optic and there's kids from several schools getting together there to march down here in the rain and could use some support. <laughs> yeah, um, also when we're talking about justice, um, I think justice implies that we're talking about supporting frontline communities and on their own terms. And the framework coming from those communities as represented by the Climate Justice Alliance, which is the premier and largest people of color led and indigenous alliance uh, world round, as well as the Grassroots Global Justice and the Indigenous Environmental Network, endorsed the Just Transition Framework, which is very well developed and I feel that that explicit language, or at least reference, uh, would be well suited to this conversation uh, and formally inserted into any proposals that we're 
and the way that we're discussing this moving forward. Okay, great. Could you get us the language by this afternoon? Do you think? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Is there other business to come before the committee? Yeah, Emily. Um, I'd just like to make an announcement that as part of the global climate strike happening today, the Bird College is striking at noon, and you can watch the live stream on our Facebook page um, if you're keen on doing that. <laughs> yes, there's a number of different student actions all over the state today in honor of Greta Thunberg's efforts to go on strike for climate change. And yesterday, she was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. So that's really a great moment for all of what we're all working on doing. Is there other business to come before the committee? Seeing none, I would accept a motion to adjourn the meeting until one o'clock when we'll come back for open space. So moved. Second. <laughs> second. Okay, so Michael moved, Elizabeth seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, thank you very much for coming. ourselves again. Some of you who were here this morning did hear that, but not everybody was in the from Middlebury. Hi, Emily from Middlebury. Olivia from Middlebury. Lisa from Middlebury. Thank you. All right. Can you read P from Essex? My name is Gwendolyn Hallsmith. I'm from Mount I'm from Cabot. <laughs> and Vermonters for a new economy. I, know. I used to live in Mount And I'm Wendy Weber from Balmer, uh, representing the Societal Transformation Lab. Yes, again, just briefly for those of you who weren't here this morning, the group that we've convened, this group, the Green New Deal for Vermont, is part of MIT's Pregnancy Institute Societal Transformation Lab. They're running similar groups. Sorry? Can you repeat that? Yeah, I know, it's a mouthful. The Green New Deal for Vermont group is part of a large international effort by the MIT Pregnancy Institute called the Societal Transformation Lab. So right now, 300 similar teams all over the world are trying to consider the deep cultural, social, and economic changes required to deal with the climate crisis. That's the purpose of the lab, because the most recent IPCC report, the Interna International Panel on Climate Change, Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, said that nothing less than Social and economic transformation is required very quickly for us to start to address the massive human and environmental crisis that we're facing. And so the MIT effort is part of that. The student climate strike is part of that. The Sunrise Movement is part of that. All of these efforts are coming together um, to try and put more pressure on the business as usual politicians here in the State House. Right before this meeting, I was able to talk to my senator, Anthony Polina, and he expressed the same frustration we heard this morning. There are 60 climate bills in front of this house, and not a single one of them is making crossover today. Just about. Yeah, I mean, it's bad. It's bad. So we're here to, we're here to raise the level of opposition to that business-as-usual approach. We're here to magnify the voices of the youth that came here today. And to support these important initiatives. And to support all of these important initiatives. 
So what we did this morning was we had a town meeting forum, a meeting where the students from Middlebury introduced a piece of legislation to us as a group to endorse the federal resolution for a Green New Deal. If you don't have a copy of this, there should still be more copies over on the table. We read the federal resolution and we all voted to ask the Vermont legislature to pass a resolution endorsing it, but with important caveats. The second part of that resolution was how to make it specifically for Vermont. And I asked for volunteers at the end of that meeting for people who would like to discuss that. What does the Vermont resolution look like? Because Representative Brian Sheena, who was with us this morning, said, <laughs> Vermont resolutions don't have 14 pages. It won't go anywhere. They, they need to be two pages long. And so we need to think about what those two pages contain. And um, that would be one of the topics that we can discuss this afternoon. This afternoon we had structured as an open space session. Now open space means that the participants in the meeting help set the agenda. So I know that two topics that I've heard that people would like to discuss are the Vermont version of the resolution, a two-pager. There's also some interest in discussing a piece of legislation that is one of those stalled pieces of legislation, H-477, which is an infrastructure act. I don't know whether it's equity and infrastructure, or it's in, but anyway, it's, a, it, it's an act to create infrastructure. And we do have a few copies of that bill with more on their way. Um, so those are the two potential discussion topics that we have. Yeah, Marge? And just transition. All right. Henry said something about getting us the language of the just transition group. Great. So those are three topics. What is the just transition? Who, who put that out? Uh, is it? This is Climate Justice Alliance, but I don't know who did the... Okay. Original. So the Climate Justice Alliance has a framework that they are asking people consider with these type of legislation, and that's one potential topic. The two-pager we need to draft for Vermont and this other bill. Now, just to have a quick show of hands to get a sense of the meeting, um, who is interested in talking about the, and you can raise your hands to all three. You don't have to pick one, okay? I'm interested. Who is interested in talking about the Vermont resolution? I want to propose something else. I okay. Paul, here we are on this auspicious day, which is crossover day. Sixty bills are laying there, and none of them made it. I think we ought to go march around up there and just protest. <laughs> I'm serious. How it. could that be? I know. It's ridiculous. It means they're just not taking this seriously. So we're going to sit here and make yet another resolution that's not going to cross over. Well, well, resolutions don't have to cross over. Well, so that is one good thing. So, yeah, so they, they could conceivably pass a resolution without having to go through crossover. Um, I agree with you. That's why we opened our meeting to the students. Um, and yet, maybe when the, the students get here, we could go up exactly, and march around. Exactly, right. So at 2 o'clock or so, the students are marching from Montpelier High School to the State House. And so I was going to propose that our whatever discussion we have, we'll stop it too. <laughs> and we'll go outside and we'll see what the students are doing and support their efforts today. And maybe they don't. Maybe they'll lead us around the state house corridors to protest this thing. You, you guys, your representative is the head of natural resources. Is she not? Amy Shelby. We're just talking to both her and our other um, senator. Senator. Mm -hmm. We were just talking to her um, in the in the cafeteria and she said she gets out of committee at three um, and if we have more language of what we would like this Vermont resolution um, in support of federal action but also action here to look like that she would be talking at three and she'd be very much wanting to take action on that um, and then Representative Tina also said that he would earlier that he would be willing to work with the we were just talking with our and Larry Cordes, yeah. yeah so we already have three co-sponsors of the Vermont resolution well, Bray said he would. yeah oh good Senator Bray, he, who's also uh, high on the resources, um, we were just talking to him in the hallway, and he was very supportive. <coughs> well. Great, good work. Helps to have meetings at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to say that when we walked out 
for the lunch break that there were a lot of other schools or individuals with their children that were arriving and standing on the steps for a short period of time and they weren't aware about of this event. So I gave my name tag to one of the teachers that was marching back with his schools. They had to go back to school. They, they were there for the noon hour. But you might be hearing from some We'd love to. Yeah, 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 we invited them to come through the organizers of the different schools, but we don't really know. It's hard. Right. right. It's hard to get through to people in this. So that might be for good I mean, reason. Totally part of the strategic um, way of how we can mobilize individuals within communities beyond the institutions because I gotta say I'm on my school board and I couldn't budge any you know I brought all this information to the board the administrators and was devastated to not even get an acknowledgement. Which, which seriously? Yeah. Which I mean you? I'm in the the White River Unified District, mm -hmm. Royalton and Bethel. Mm -hmm. So newly you know newly marked school um, I'm gonna bring it up at the board meeting next week. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't even, you know, try to get my kids to skip school today, and they were more concerned about missing a class. It, you know, it's like the, the discussions aren't happening. You know, if it was, they would have been encouraged to come here or to do a, an activity after school. And I'm not sure. It's possible they did something, and I just don't know about it. But I'm going to find out this week. Maybe you could tell your board that the citizens at this town meeting were appalled at their lack of. I will, and I'm on the board, and I'm going to say I am also. I'm, I'm devastated. Well, there has been talk about April town meetings, right? Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because that would address this question of how do we get more people involved. Yeah, so um, Sunrise overall has been working on setting up town halls all across the country for people to come sort of like we did this morning um, and talk about concepts of Green New Deal, concepts of just transition framework, um, what we want this to look like locally and nationally. Um, so in April, those town halls are gonna be happening all across the country. There's also gonna be sort of this road tour where people who have been working on Green New Deal are gonna go all around the country and talk about it in like big um, training meetings. Uh, there aren't any of those in Vermont, um, so I think the nearest one would be Boston, but we were gonna think about setting up um, with like our small sunrise group, uh, town hall likely in Middlebury um, or on April 19th. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to invite anyone who wants to come to come to that. And then also we had talked about that that would just be a start of more conversations um, because sometimes when things are very geographically isolated, not everyone might want to come to Middlebury. So having some more town halls across Vermont this summer, if that's something that would be interesting to people, um, but yeah, we were thinking of trying to get as many people as possible, and if it sounds good, we can book a space at our college, but if people would rather have it somewhere else, we can work work that out. Um, but yeah, lots of excitement for big town hall meetings. It's, and it's great. Seems, it seems to me that one piece of work is connecting. We need to have a, a microphone, Chris. Yeah. Pass it to Mike. No, that's so that one doesn't work. Ones that travel. Oops, hold on. It seems, whoa. It seems to me that um, connecting kids, uh, you know, so I know several school walkouts that are happening. It's got nothing to do with coming to Montpelier. It's they're walking, they're, you know, 200 Woodstock high school students are walking out, marching to the green and doing a teaching on the, on the green. You know, that kind of thing is happening now. Um, so connecting, you know, those lead, you know, what I would call the lead, the lead, the lead kids, the, um, you know, in the different schools, so that that kind of connection can happen local, you know, so Middlebury can happen with stuff, and, you know, Brattleboro, Brattleboro. Yeah. Brattleboro. Yeah. Brattleboro. Yeah. Great. Um, I also just to, um, oh, remember that um, with the ST lab. In the next two or three months, we've got more meetings. We, if we begin to craft something here for Vermont's version, you know, we'll be taking your voices further, or hopefully part of it too. But we're not trying to just get it done today, right? True. Oh, right. All right. So, oh, did you have a comment you wanted to? Oh, yeah. Give her, 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 just pass it around. Um, my name is Jael. I work for 350 Vermont. Um, and we are having a climate walk from Middlebury to Montpelier April 5th through the 9th. And we're inviting, we definitely.
definitely want more youth involved. Um, and um, but anyone is welcome. We will be having um, a gathering ceremony in Prague's Park. Um, that's where the pipeline goes through, and then also here on um, on the ninth in Montpelier. Um, but I also wanted to comment because my daughter goes at e goes to E32. She's in eighth grade, and we couldn't find any information on where to go, who to contact, or was it happening, was it not happening. And as an organizer, I was very frustrated with the whole process. So I want to offer my expertise in whatever, you know, I want it to be youth led, but, um, you know, give pointers or tips or anything like that if you can. Great, thank you. Yeah, I know for my part, we issued a press release about it that was um, not covered by the Vermont Press. We released it early this week saying that students were welcome to join us here. I also sent emails to all the organizers that I knew who were organizing the youth thing. But God bless them, they wanted it to be youth led. And so the, even when I publicized the fact that the marches were happening, it was like, we want it to be youth, we don't want adults in the march, which is fine. Um, but I did my best, is all I'm saying, yeah. to try and let them know and let them know to come here if they wanted to. We changed our agenda. We're happy to do something. So, did you have something you wanted to say? You got to say it into the uh, I don't know. I think you accidentally pushed it off. Um, so, um, how I think we could like, all help each other and make more people like wanna help us. Um, I think that we should like all work together and like hold up our signs, like not screaming like help us or like we're just like raising up our signs because we wanna help our community be a better place and we wanna help each other. Great idea. Thank you. We should all walk together and hold up our signs. Let our voices be heard. And we need your voices heard because you guys are going to be facing the climate crisis much more than we are. Did you have something you want to say? No, we're just the keeper of the stick. Okay. So speaking of the stick, it's um, 1.30. What I would propose as the moderator is that, again, let's just have a quick show of hands. The first topic was people who want to work on the two-pager for Vermont, okay? People who want to look at the Infrastructure Act, anybody? I don't know what it is. I know, we have the cop, page 477. I haven't read it in any years. But it was one of the things that were proposed. And then there was a third topic. Oh, the justice, the just transition. Anybody interested in that? What are they? The just transition framework which has been put out by the Climate Alliance. There are principles and practices. I'm presuming, I, I, I haven't seen it either. Um, that we could discuss. Okay, that was not inclusive. <laughs> so, that's, that's the first one again. The first one was working on the two-page resolution that Vermont legislators need. Raise your, hands. Raise your hands again on that. Okay. So I'm going to propose that the people who are interested in working on that gather on this side of this table. Now, how about the just transition principles? Do we have people that are interested in working on that? Okay. Just transition will be at this end of the table. And since since we don't yet have enough copies of the Infrastructure Act, it's called the Green Mountain Deal, I gather. Let's wait till they come. <laughs> if we get enough copies, then we'll take that one. But right now, if you want to look at this and talk about the just transition, be on this side of this table, and if you want to work on the two-page resolution to go to the Vermont legislature, sit on this side of this table. We will do that for approximately half an hour, which is which will bring us to two o'clock. I think the idea was this, this was not separate some of the language that's already been crafted for our two-page Oh, okay. So it's all one, it's all one committee. All right. So let's, let's just all work on the, the resolution, if that's the intent. But maybe take just a minute. You know, this morning, I, we all read 14-page resolution so that everybody knew what was in it. 
it helps to read the stuff that we're looking at to make sure you know what we're talking about. So if you want to just take a couple minutes to look through this, there are more copies. Uh, Ethan, you need one? So the idea was that the Vermont version would emphasize the elements of justice, economic change, that are in the so, just transition document. So let's just read the regener regenerative economy model. Okay. What page is that? It's, uh, page three. Page three. On page three. The, the governance is deep democracy. The resources are regenerative, regenerative, maybe it's regeneration. Um, regeneration. We're on page three in this section right here. And the, the worldview is caring and sacredness. The purpose is ecological and social well-being. And at the center is cooperation. What do you think about just us reading the principles? Okay. Going through the principles, each person reading so that starts on page four. Why don't you start? A principle. A CPA just transition principles. A just transition moves us toward win begin. Win begin means that we can live well without living better at the expense of others. Workers, community residents, women, and indigenous peoples around the world have a fundamental human right to clean, healthy, and adequate air, water, land, food, education, and shelter. We must have just relationships with each other and with the natural world of which we are part. The rights of peoples, communities, and nature must supersede the rights of the individual. A uh, just transition creates meaningful work. A just transition centers on the development of human potential, creating opportunities for people to learn, grow, and develop to their full capacities and interests. We are all born leaders, and a regenerative economy supports and nurtures that leadership. In the process, we are transforming ourselves, each other, our communities, and our society as a whole. Meaningful work is life affirming. You can pass if you want.
communities have the resources yeah. and expertise to be the leaders of democratic solutions. Very good. You're very good. I'm not either. I just transitioned equitably redistributes resources and power. We must work to build new systems that are good for all people and not just a few. Just transition must actively work against and transform current and historic social inequities based on race, class, and gender, immigrant status, and other forms of oppression. Just transition fights to reclaim capital and resources for the regeneration of geographies and sectors of the economy where these inequities are most pervasive. A just transition requires regenerative ecological economics. Just transition must advance ecological resilience, reduce resource consumption, restore biodiversity in traditional ways of life, and undermine and undermine extractive economies, including capitalism, that erodes the ecological basis of our collective well-being. This requires a relocalization and dem democratization of primary production and consumption by building up local food, food systems, local clean energy, small-scale production, that are sustainable economically and ecologically. This also means producing to live well without living better at the expense of others. A just transition retains culture and tradition. Capitalism has forced many communities to sacrifice culture and tradition for economic survival. It has also defaced and destroyed land held as sacred. Just transition must create inclusive, inclusionary spaces for all traditions and cultures, recognize them as integral to the health and vibrant economy. It should also make reparations for land that has been stolen and or destroyed by capitalism, colonialism, patriarchy, genocide, and slavery. A just transition built for, oh, a just transition fought with local, regional, national, and international solidarity. A just transition must be liberatory and transformative. The impact of the extractive economy knows no borders. We recognize the interdependence of our communities as well as our issues. Therefore, our solutions call for local, regional, national, and global solidarity that confronts imperialism and militarism. Better, better. <laughs> a just transition builds what we need now. We must build the world we need now. This may begin at a local small scale and must expand to begin to displace extractive practices. We must build and flex the muscles needed to meet our community's needs. Okay, that, those are the principles for a just transition. Now maybe we could get some starting language for the resolution for the last state house related to this principle. Um, I suggest that maybe we start with three points, a three-prong resolution of the transportation and agriculture. And there was one other thing that I might bring. Thank you. Yes. Transportation. I, I think I can. Mean, I was hoping that we could start with the equity part of it. Um, and I was just talking with uh, Barbara who was here earlier, and in her um, nonprofit, uh, she's focusing on four things. And, and at the end, she said, if 
there is equity and um, inclusion on the leading edge, then climate change will be sucked along in the backdrop of that. And so, yeah, so I think we need to start with a sentence about, uh, about all of us who are all in the same boat on this issue of climate change. So I don't know how to articulate that, but those are my thoughts. Um, let me just summarize what I think you said. And I think it's an important point. It gets to this question of justice. And the justice agenda, the just transition agenda, being one of the main drivers and one of the foundations for the Green New Deal. So what Elizabeth was talking about is that if we take equity and justice as the driver for this, the climate change issues will likely start to solve themselves. I mean, I, I think that's what I heard you say, that, that justice has got to be at the forefront of it because that's what's going to drive the change. Is that yeah. I, I, and I think it's, it's partly, if we could include it as, it maybe say something like climate change affects us all. Therefore, we realize the, the foundational importance or something like that of, of equity and uh, social equity. And we could add another word or whatever the language is. I don't know. I'm so short term. <laughs> You know, and then and period, and then in the next sentence, go into the three prong acts. Well, we actually had an intervention from one of our climate strikers. Why don't you say what you said? Then? Another really important part of this is militarism. Yeah. Yes. Militarism. Oh. Militarism. Okay. Militarism. So that would be the fourth prong. Given now Vermont is as big a military economy as some states are, but with the F 35 issue coming to Burlington and nuclear missiles possibly being the face there, we could look at how would that money be spent better on things that we want and need for the state of Vermont. So it's a four problems. Four problems, yes. So let me just read back and then I'll call on you. Um, if equity and inclusion are the leading edge of the legislation, then climate change will start to solve. Climate change affects us all, therefore we realize the foundational importance of social equity and justice. I would start with that, that last sentence and just forget all the other stuff. But I am, I am the matrix of cutting. That's what we need. Okay. Okay, climate change affects us all, therefore we realize the foundational importance of social equity and justice. Yes. Okay. And did you have something you wanted to add? Oh, no, I just had to say, I just had to more Okay. Yes. Maybe we could add that um, climate change affects us all, but not, not, not equally. The oh. Hi. Um, so maybe we could add that kind of change affects us all, but not affecting everyone equally. Um, like there's this part on page four of the um, federal Green New Deal resolution that says, whereas climate change pollution and environmental de destruction have exacerbated systemic and racial, regional, social, environmental, and economic injustices by disproportionately affecting, um, and it has a list of um, frontline and vulnerable communities. So talking about that, um, how it unites everyone, but that the impacts are not equal. Right. I guess the, my thoughts are that we can maybe go into that a little bit later on, but start with the fact, I mean, I think that there's something to be said politically for the, the getting people to understand that we're all in the same boat together, and that that's what the opening line should be without getting into the weeds too much, and then we can bring that back up in a later paragraph, I think it's hugely important. Well, right now I would say climate change affects us all, but the impacts are not equal. Therefore, we realize the foundational importance of social equity. That would be great. I mean, that, did that. That it sort of captures both the ideas yep. without wanting to pull out of the floor. Okay, we've got to start. Back here. I just have a question. Somebody's putting a watch near the microphone. Here, can so we have the microphone in all this 
Yeah, keep only one out of the time. Yeah. Am I done? What part do you do? Well, everybody needs to speak. Okay. Well, I wish that everybody would speak in the microphone because I can't hear half of it. Um, that's basically why I raised my hand. If people could speak into it. I can't. I want to get what's going on. She wants people to speak into the microphone because she can't hear. So we're trying to get people to speak into the microphones. Just keep your watches away from them. Apparently also, just, that's just turn them off when you're not using them. And turn them off when you're not using them, okay. Yeah, yeah Alec. Uh, Speak into a microphone, grab one. I think, I think the second line should be that Vermont has an outsized footprint um, comparatively, and because of this, it is our, our responsibility and moral duty to act swiftly in reducing our emissions. And then probably the third line for you would be, beyond reducing our emissions, we need to, or, or, g given this footprint with its already massive uh, cost imposed on the lowest income Vermonters, we need to work on, on programs to redistribute wealth effectively. socio-culturally a kind of like insider buzz phrase. I would really like us to talk to more about the economy, you know, first. I mean, I mean, it's fine for that to be in there somewhere, but for that to be the second article, I think we would lose a lot of people right there. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Um, yeah. Well, it, I, I understand your concern about the term carbon footprint. Because I agree that that is a bit of a, a bit of insider jargon. Most people wouldn't know what that means. But I think it is an important point. It's not the most, objection. Most people know what it is. It's not the objection that's the insider jargon. The idea that our contribution needs to be about laundering the Vermont carbon footprint is bad strategy. The Vermont carbon footprint could be a negative carbon footprint, and we would be on our way to hell in a handbasket yeah. globally. We need to be really emphasizing regional, right. national, global solutions right. and not trying to be focused on Vermont's carbon footprint. I actually think that that's a golden apple flung, thrown off the trail and really is, is dangerous to, to us being able to exercise our, our most potent potential contribution, which is leadership on, on a national scale, right? N not just this is how we do it here, but actually moving and organizing on a regional scale beyond our political boundaries. All right. Okay, so um, I would like you, if that's your proposal, to suggest different wording. <laughs> and let's see if Alec agrees. Um, okay. Speaking to the mic, please. I, I would say um, <clears throat> that. Uh, our, our economy and the futures of our kids are um, facing untenable, um, what's a better word for untenable? Something like untenable challenges, and um, we need to take this opportunity to uh, unify um, and both try to prevent and prepare for the climate emergency as our number one. Uh, it's not just the economy, but it's also the environment, I would say the environment, the economy, and the future of our kids. Yeah. I would just put economy first because it builds more common ground. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. okay yeah, would still just, keep the other stuff gonna... down low, like lower, or would you be against that? I would defer. So, I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> Because you didn't speak the other, 
Let me just repeat what I got so far out of what Henry said. Vermont's economy, environment, and the future for our children are facing untenable challenges. It's not feedback anymore. It's not feedback, it's something else. It's something that you're like. But anyway, um, Vermont's economy, environment, and the future for our children are, are facing untenable challenges. We need to play a leadership role in addressing these challenges. How's that? Um, too many challenges will have to rephrase one of those words, but that's fine, we'll do that. We need to play a leadership role, but you had something you wanted to say about maybe priorities or addressing or issues and maybe instead of untenable, unprecedented. Unprecedented, yeah. That's the word. Yeah, I, I believe, I'm fine. I'm very happy with moving the Vermont footprint down, down lower, but I still think it's important because, you know, if we're, when we're talking about a just transition and we're talking about who really needs to lead the way with emissions reductions, uh, it's people, it, it's, pl it's places like Vermont, places who have, since, since we really started developing this country, emitted a huge footprint comparatively. And while it's not each individual that needs to act, I think it's part of the premise behind why the state of Vermont needs to be putting money into this. That's about it. I, I actually think that the, the, the information about Vermont being a higher user of carbon per capita, maybe that's a way to put it instead yeah, of footprint. Like it's important information and it's a very important point in this case. So um, maybe that's the third sentence. So we could say Vermont per capita uses a higher level of carbon or emissions. Generate, generate, we generate more carbon emissions than other states. Yeah, and, and yeah. given this, it is imperative that, this, that Vermont Right. Or swiftly act to reduce it. To reduce. Immediately. I like to say that I think this group wordsmithing is a deadly process. I think we need to brainstorm some basic ideas and perhaps throw it to a committee to do the wordsmithing. We could do this for hours and not get through one point. Well, we are going to do it for hours. We're only going to do it for another 10 minutes. And so breaking up at this point is also not really possible. So we're going to keep with this discussion for now, and then we'll pick it up later. But the student strikers are going to be here at two. So, so let's make the yeah. fourth sentence about the four problems. OK. To this end, or whenever you want to start it, or the, the four initiatives that, you know, the four main, our, four main initiatives are colon, I also want to say that current science is proposing that carbon sequestration through photosynthesis, photosynthesis might be our only possible solution. And in this agrarian culture, that's something that we have at our fingertips and need to focus on and educate. Can I ask you? Okay, I'm getting this the fourth one. Let me just read it back. Agriculture, transportation. to explain this to 
adults who don't have any background. So in Hardwick, we have a range, and the average age of rangers is 80-something years old. And um, I'm proposing that we do STEAM for adults, you know. Okay. Um, but yeah, the uh, biochar, we just had a big gathering in Hardwick um, of people who are, are making it. We have a waste reduction problem, you know, issue. And sustainable consumption, I mean, it's, this is my issue with the, the new Green Deal is, Assuming that technology and growth forevermore of 3%, we have reached our limits of growth a long time ago. Um, it's, it's beyond um, mitigation, you know? I mean, it's, it's time to stop. And I'm hoping, I thought that uh, Greta, Swedish. Yeah, Greta Thunberg. Is she speaking today? Or is it going to be her tag? <laughs> yeah, no. that's what I heard. You know, I thought, well, what are they going to play the TED Talk? Her TED Talk? No. I don't think so. No, we're just, the, the, the student climate strike today right. is being done in over 70 countries around the world, hundreds of thousands of students walking out of their schools to join Greg in her efforts to draw attention okay. to climate change. There was a front porch forum notice. Oh, yeah, you know, the isn't here. Was, <laughs> didn't have she's, too many details. She's, she's skipping school today in Sweden. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let me just make sure I got your point right first. So sustainable consumption, that we need to educate adults about their own personal, individual carbon emissions and the ways in which oh, they our, 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 our. This about ways in which we, we can reduce our own impact. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to push back on talking of using the word carbon. Obviously, carbon is a massive problem here. But I think if we're going to do this with an emphasis on a just transition, we need to be thinking beyond carbon. Vermont gets a ton of its power from Hydro Quebec, and that's displaced tons of indigenous people. Yet that's like a renewable resource. So I think that. Yeah. It, the problems that you know we can't we can't just be talking about carbon. Um, so I think that. I don't know what kind of language that would imply we use, but I think that we need to be conscious about not just pointing the finger at coal and oil and natural gas. Okay, so yeah. personal, individual, carbon emissions, and other harmful patterns of consumption. Greenhouse gas. Or against the environment. Not just greenhouse gas, but maybe greenhouse gas instead of carbon. Yes. I think we got some. Henry, and then. I've had my hand up. Oh, she's out of here. Sorry. So I. I guess my question is, um, we're talking about the types of carbon or consumption, but I also want to talk about the quantity, the volume of consumption, because if we're just trying to replace renewable energy for, I mean, re replace oil for renewable energy so that we can continue doing it at the amount that we're doing, I think that we're already overusing and over consuming. So I'm hoping that that kind of language is in there and it's achievable. I mean, in our household, we live off grid, we're, we're using 15% of the amount of energy that a similar household is using. And it's not that hard to do, and those technologies are out there, and I think that needs to be addressed. We need to use less, we can use less. We're in a consumptive society, everybody wants everything to mock today, and we don't, there's ways that we can work around that. Yeah, so the quantity and quality of consumption needs to be addressed. Excellent point. I don't want to lose track of my We have his hand up, and then Henry, and then, and then, oh, okay. I want to use our minds, but I'm trying to be here. Yeah. So, um, what's your name? Liam. Hi, Liam, welcome. We're, we're happy to hear what you have to say. Go ahead, buddy. So I have a few ideas of like how we can like stop like the North and South Pole from like melting. Instead of using like we can like walk instead of like drive, and we can also do a few things. And I mean, it will help our environment. Just not stopping the North and South Pole from melting. We can use like metal straws and we use them to donate them, and paper straws so we can just recycle them. Great, great suggestion. So we're gonna 
try and stop the North and South Pole from melting by recycling and reducing our consumption, which is exactly what we were just talking about, and driving less and walking more. Great suggestion. Okay. Hey. Um, oh, oh, so we do want to hear from the students. Here goes. I'm gonna ask, yeah, I'm gonna risk, uh, I'm gonna ask this at the risk of sounding stupid or whatever, but the reason I think that nothing has changed is because the higher ups or the one people with the money, they don't want it to change. So what am I missing here? I mean, we've got how many, one percent, one percent that's got the money, the all the money, most of the money, and and they don't they don't want to change from from you know gas or fossil fuels or whatever. It's money. It's more and more and more money. What about the other 99 percent of us? Where is the rest of this room that should be here? You know, how are we not reaching them? I mean, 70, how much? No, 99 percent. Great, well, thank you. I don't understand how, how to reach the other, all the other people. You're but important. this should be changed. It's been going on for countless years. Your point is very important, and that's actually why the fourth prong of what we're talking about for Vermont is money and banking. Because the money and banking systems are what create the 1%. And so by changing the money and banking systems, we can change some of the drivers of both the inequity and the runaway inequality that we're seeing in our country, and climate change, because that same monetary system drives the growth imperative which is what makes everybody want to grow, 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 consume, consume, consume. We live on an infinite planet, according to the people that advocate for unlimited growth. We can't keep pretending that that's the case. Now, in terms of this group, hey, Grace, welcome. Um, this group is a multi-stakeholder group, a relatively small group. We weren't trying necessarily to fill this room today. It was just the room we had reserved. So we weren't necessarily recruiting hundreds of people to come. We were welcoming students who came because we had a warm, dry room on a rainy day when they were planning the protests. But um, in terms of building the movement, the Sunrise Movement is working on that, and that's what we generally were talking about before with the town meetings coming up in April. And um, the student climate strike is working on that. They had you know, 70 countries and hundreds of thousands of students participating today. So there's a lot of different pieces to the puzzle. And what we're trying to accomplish with this particular piece is to have a reasonable dialogue amongst people that don't necessarily always see eye to eye. We had a very good discussion this morning, partially because we didn't all agree on one particular thing. And so we'd love to encourage all of you that are here to continue to come to our meetings. If you have signed the sign-in sheet over here, you will get notices of the meeting, and you can come. The next meeting will be in Middlebury. Um, date to be determined, place to be determined, but we will let you know. And the meeting after that, we're planning at UVM in Burlington. And then I believe we'll have a final, some kind of meeting here in early June, because uh, Lieutenant Governor Zuckerman has agreed to meet with us and learn about what we've come up with as a group for a Vermont Green New Deal. Madam Chairman? Yes. Um, just quickly, I have to go to the doctor's appointment. Uh, I wanted to say about the article about individual uh, consumption, etc. The research does not bear that out. When we're talking about the 1% haves, that's what they want to hear. Oh yeah, don't talk to other people. Just eat the right things in your kitchen and just be quiet and it'll all go away. That is antithetical to a meaningful response to the emergency. All right, individual consumer solutions could not be farther from effective, and the research does prove that out. Uh, there's a global research project called Drawdown, as well as a bunch of other research projects that are very clear 
only large industrial scale or larger responses to climate change on economic and other levels are going to be a meaningful um, response. So I really, I, I'm, I am opposed to there being the language of individual consumerism anywhere in the, the product for this group. Um, your, your objection is registered. Thank you, I'll see you guys in a little bit. <laughs> Great, and then I'll come back. Well, uh, I know that other people have mentioned agriculture, but I'm going to add another uh, another emphasis on that, and that there are some very cheap and effective ways for us to begin to address the problem of uh, not just carbon, but other greenhouse gases such as methane and especially nitrous oxide uh, that are the main contributors uh, of the food system and agriculture to climate change. And also uh, that we can't, even if we stopped all carbon emissions tomorrow, we're still going to be in deep doo unless we also cool the climate by keeping the soil covered and building the soil carbon sponge, which uh, many of us have been learning and talking about uh, in the past few years and are uh, very excited about the potential of not just uh, saving the climate, but also improving the quality of our food and cleaning the water, on and on and on. So, uh, I, I would really put a lot of emphasis on that. It, would, it, is, uh, it would not be a big deal for us to think about some form of compensation for farmers and other land managers who could pro provide those kinds of ecosystem services that would improve things dramatically much more quickly than any technological fix and much more easily than a, a big political battle over Green New Deal and more public expenditures, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my piece. Thanks. All right, I am gonna note the time. It's now five after two. And I, I know I heard from a lot of people that to really support the speakers today, they wanted to join them. Do you have some last speakers? Oh, sorry. Um, it's kind of like Liam's, um, that I think that we should all, um, like, the people that are littering, no, it's, I'm not calling any names because it's not nice, but, um, the people that litter, and I think they should stop, um, and, like, if we keep on making our earth more warm, all the cold places that our earth, like they'll all turn like very hot and the animals like penguins, polar bears, other animals, they'll die because they need the cold to survive. Um, Cause if they get too hot, like they'll start getting ill um, and then they'll, they'll die one by one. So if we don't like, if we don't stop that, then we're gonna hurt animals and us too because we need the cold too. Not like we're polar bears or penguins or any like that. But we're kind of like animals too, but we just don't look like them. Okay, thank you. So if animals like penguins and polar bears will die if it gets too hot. Will hurt the animals and us too. We need the cold too. Is that it? Okay, thank you. And another one from back there? And then me. Thank you. 
力，当主持人，去教你们孩子。and I'm a member of the Vermont Youth Lobby and a climate activist at Montpelier High School. I found myself walking out of school today for many reasons. I walked out today for the Green Mountains. I walked out today for my peers who deserve a place in this conversation. I walked out today to show everyone in the State House that I will not tolerate climate inaction. I walk out today so that the children of the future will not have to. This planet will wait for no one, including us. If we want to make a difference in a climate issue of global concern, we have no time left to wait another year. We are almost halfway through this session, and although there have been many bills introduced, I have seen no leap of faith in a plan of passing a bold climate change solution this year. The Speaker of the House has said the House doesn't have time for a carbon tax. What do they have time for then? We the youth are ready to see the solution for this climate crisis because doing nothing is not an option. I know leaders in the House and Senate believe this issue is real and pressing, but we are looking for an active plan that has purpose and intention to make a vast difference. 
Be it your way or my way, the youth of Vermont are here to make sure our clean planet is well on its way. Hello everyone, my name is Max Sabo. I go to U32 High School, and I am also a member of the Vermont Youth Lobby. First of all, I wanted to just say how amazing it is to see such a great turnout. Thank you all for coming today. It's yeah. amazing. But uh, I will be honest, I had previously planned on talking about just some exciting like climate action stuff that I was uh, that I would just I'd seen and I had I had wanted to talk about because it's stuff that's going to be coming in the near future. But then I read the Vermont House Democrats plan for the rest of the session, and I was shocked to see that in their top five priorities, although all very important, very important things, climate change was not on the list. I would expect that to be a six bullet point and actually be at the top. And, in fact, I couldn't find climate change anywhere on the newly published website. This stands out to me because it shows that my representatives don't care about climate change. We already are many years late in addressing this very important issue, and now it appears that we're about to throw away another year. I am so grateful to be standing alongside Representative Deanna Gonzalez today, who happens to be a co-sponsor of H-477 Vermont Equity and Infrastructure Act. Now that, that is the type of climate legislation that we at the Youth Lobby support. It is bold, it hits many crucial attack points for addressing climate issues in Vermont. And yet, it's being taken up so late in this process that it won't even be acted on this session. So it is essential that we take opportunities like today, where students have taken time out of their day to protest climate inaction. Because these are the times where we can show our elected officials what we want to see from them in office. We need to show them that we want bold and comprehensive climate legislation and that we will elect those who will give that to us. And then from that point, we need to hold our elected officials accountable for following through on passing this legislation. No more waiting. We've waited long enough, and we're not going to throw away another year. Thank you. I'm also a member of the Vermont Youth Lobby. Woo! Okay. So, I'm also a senior this year, and I think that's pretty scary looking at that, especially for a bunch of youth. It's quite possibly all the decisions I'm going to make are going to affect me for the rest of my life, hopefully for the better. And I think that's what working in this building is like. You're making decisions for Vermonters that will quite possibly affect them for the rest of their life, hopefully for the better. But that's their job. It's their job to have Vermont's best interests at heart and always in mind. It's their job to make big decisions that will make our state better in the long run and not just at this moment. It's their job, and I'm here because I don't think the policymakers are doing their jobs to their full potential, especially when talking about climate change. Vermont has the potential to be the leader in America in terms of going green, and we simply aren't doing enough. The biggest thing Vermont needs to be doing right now is distancing ourselves from fossil fuels. Vermont has received $18.7 million from Volkswagen. The money comes from what was supposed to be clean diesel. It wasn't. They lied to us about how clean their diesel really was. This money needs to be put towards transportation instead of going back to the same diesel-eating buses that we've been using for years. It's a simple change that wouldn't affect Vermonters' tax money at all. It's money that we have, and we simply aren't doing anything with it. And if you don't find that ridiculous, I don't know what you will. <laughs> the policymakers aren't doing enough. They aren't doing what we elected them to do, and if hundreds of kids skipping school and standing in your offices doesn't tell you that, I don't know what will. 
This is a beautiful sight. Standing here with all of you, standing up for all of us. Thank you so much for being here today, for saying we need solutions to the climate change. We need to be able to have smart policies that benefit all of us. Right now, we have so much money going out of state for fossil fuels that are poisoning our planet, that are impacting in negative ways our health in the short and long term. I'm the lead sponsor on H-477, an Equity and Infrastructure Act, that for a very small amount of money over the course of 10 years would put $1.6 billion into Vermont's economy. <laughs> would help us get on track to our statutory and Paris Accords levels. Would reduce our carbon emissions and be a leader for the nation. This act addresses the inequity of, uh, of living rurally, the inequity of poverty, and by putting money into the pockets of folks that don't have that much, we benefit all of us. When, <laughs> when we are able to weatherize our homes, our schools, and municipalities, we not only reduce our carbon pollution, we also reduce our negative health impacts, we, we increase our comfort, and we, in, we reduce our taxes because less money heating the outside is better for all of us. With this $1.6 billion, we were able to increase our electrification. We were able to have electric vehicle incentives, electric vehicle charging stations, high energy heat pumps, high efficiency heat pumps and other ways that we, can that we can reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, keep that money in Vermont, and uh, impact climate change. This is a bill that, uh, while one can say it's bold, it's the boldness that we need, it also is very small. It's a very small money um, at, at the pump, and it has a huge impact. And so I really want to encourage you all to look at this particular policy. There are other policies as well that we can support and see what we can accomplish because uh, getting the gas prices to what they were last November is not that significant. But it will have a huge amount of money coming back into Vermont, a huge amount of, of possibility of addressing our statutory requirements and reducing our carbon emissions. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much for standing up for all of us. the climate, this room is heating at an alarming rate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hey, hey everyone, I'm Gabe Groveman. I'm a freshman at MHS, and I'd like to start off by thanking everyone who left school early to come out here today. <laughs> Just by being here, you're showing all the legislators in this building that we do care about these issues, that we'll fight for these issues, and that even though all of us will pay, you're doing far too little on climate, young people like us will be the ones who will bear the burden the most. Now I'm sure all of you know our climate is changing. Every year we see hurricane after hurricane in, in the Caribbean, droughts and wildfires in California, more and more ticks in Vermont each summer, and the list goes on. We will continue to go on, but the question is how much longer will the list have to get for us to finally take action and do something? Because the cost of doing nothing will only get greater, not only in hard economic terms, but in quality of life, public health, the diversity of life on this planet, and the diversity of life on this planet. These costs will ultimately be borne mostly on our generation, who didn't create this problem, but will no doubt be the ones who have to deal with it. There was, there was a report a few months ago from the International Panel on Climate Change that showed that if we don't start at least, to, to, we don't start to at least try to seriously reduce carbon emissions, there will be a catastrophic damage to our environment by the year 2030. That's only 11 years and our government isn't helping. Another report, followed by Oral Change International, exposed that, on average, the government spends over $20 billion on fossil fuel subsidies. Just imagine the amount of work we could do with even a quarter of the $20 billion a year we give to gas and oil companies. 
If we work together by creating climate change, by taking climate change seriously and passing comprehensive climate legislation, then maybe we can save our planet. Right now, we have the power to change our future. We have the power to fight this. And if after today nothing happens, if after today we continue to pollute our atmosphere and destroy our land, then at least I can say I made an effort. But if in 50 years the Earth is still standing, then everyone here can say that we did do something. We made a difference. We were able to come together as, un as a united front and say enough is enough, and decide to recognize climate change as the threat it is. Yet while us being here is a, su a substantial step forward, the power still lies in the hands of the policymakers to make it happen. My hope is that this push from youth across the globe will be the push needed to wake people up and create meaningful change for our future. Because if we don't do something, then who will?